Apologize. Let's try it again. What about now? Yes. We can hey, see about that. So, as I was saying, um, I am an amateur uh, filmmaker. Love things all history. I'm a Monmouth County native. Uh, I live in Fairhaven. My family's been in the area since 1904, and uh, just. Uh, sort of always fascinated in, in the history of the area. I was inspired in 2016 while out in a boat in the river by the Highlands Bridge at low tide and looked across at Sandy Hook and saw some pilings coming out of the water. And I knew that they had been part of what I thought was just a beach club from the 1950s that I knew about because my parents had, had basically met, met there and dated there. And, uh, but that was about all I knew about it. And as I watched the cars stream out onto the hook on that summer day, I thought none of those people know that there was a beach club there and somebody ought to tell that story. And it was from that that I ended up meeting Susan Samless Gardner and uh, my fascination just opened up beyond what I could have ever imagined. And uh, as a result, I ended up making uh, the film Destinations Past Highland Beach, which really is sort of the cliff notes for what you're going to hear about tonight. Um, Susan's book is the deep dive on this topic, which is absolutely fascinating. And even though it's a very deep dive, the book reads in a very light and easy way. Um, Susan is an accomplished uh, educator and author and historian, but more importantly, is so personally invested, as you'll learn in this story, uh, she is the quintessential person to tell it. Um, and so it's my honor to, to uh, bring this uh, to life tonight for you through her book uh, with Susan. And we're going to start with a, a short video and, and she'll pick it up on the other side of that. The ability to look at a narrow strip of sand and envision a massive resort teeming with life was the vision of William Samless in the 1880s. For over 70 years, Sandless and his family operated one of the most popular destinations on the Jersey coast. Today, Erlia Trace survives, and now you can learn about the characters who created this place and how time, technology, and politics washed it all away. Introducing Sandy Hook's Lost Highland Beach Resort, a book by Susan Sandless Gardner. In researching this book, I learned what the lost history of Highland Beach teaches us today. This is a story of perseverance, challenges, families, and most of all, fun at the beach. After a large investment of money by Highland Beach Improvement Company, William Sandless begins building the resort in November 1887. I'll be sharing photos about the history of Highland Beach from 1888 to 1962. Some of you may even recognize a few of the faces in the photographs. Chris? Yeah, I'm working on it, sorry, there you go. <laughs> What does a fish have to do with it? Recognizing the opportunity to bring a day at the beach to thousands living within reach of Sandy Hook triggered the risk takers to invest in this excursion resort. Sandless and real estate developer Ferdinand Fish put their idea in motion under the Highland Beach Improvement Company. Life is being revolutionized by inventions for the betterment of man. These inventions fuel the golden era when they provide people with things they need and Highland Beach surges forward to meet the public's thirst for recreation. I always found it extraordinary that the resort builder and real estate developer had the names Sandlast and Fish. Fish only remained 10 years, while William Sandless gave 50 years to the resort until 1938 when he passed away and a modern era was on the horizon. In 1880, 
the Highland Beach Association purchases the property on Sandy Hook. It would be 10 years before development began. The first blizzard arrives immediately. A storm of the century, the Great White Hurricane, in March 1888, almost wipes out all their work during the construction phase with 58 inches of snow and 40 foot drifts. They finished the first season and closed down. And again, in December, a late season storm arrives, forcing them to continue to rebuild. The 1888 Frank Leslie print appears in his illustrated magazine, showing a guests only sign on the left floating in the turbulent waters during the storm. We can only imagine what yearly effort it took to keep going in the face of such storms and businesses being wiped out in the off season. A number of buildings and amusements were constructed as shown in the 1890 Sanborn map. The lots purchased for the resort by the Highland Beach Association included five acres with only 50 yards between the river and the ocean. This is the only resort on the Jersey Shore to have such close proximity to both bodies of water, offering a unique opportunity for bathers. This 1893 original Sandless House was built with the timbers from the Great Switchback Railroad roller coaster, dismantled due to a patent infringement. My grandfather and his mother are standing in the doorway of the house, placed next to the ocean jetty on the right. A cycling shed can be seen across from the first floor fruit and cigar store run by William's German immigrant mother, Annie. She was considered a treasure by resort visitors for 30 years. The Sandless House is shown here in 1950 at Sandy Hook. My grandmother, Helen Sandless, and three of her five grandchildren are in the 1950 beach photo to the right. Curiosity as her granddaughter made me search for the answers about why my grandfather came to live next to the Shrewsbury River within a stone's throw of the Atlantic Ocean, a precarious place to live. The same curiosity as an author led me to learn more about the house. The one where I grew up on the Sandy Hook Peninsula with five siblings, two parents, and two grandmothers. As the granddaughter of William Sandless, the bathing business and hotel pioneer, it compelled me to learn what set the stage for the 25-year-old son of an immigrant carpenter to build a resort that brought 125,000 visitors a summer to Sandy Hook. I remember my grandmother Helen's stories and photos about days in the past on Sandy Hook. The resort story started in November 1887 where I learned about the perseverance of living next to the Shrewsbury River and Atlantic Ocean. In the earliest years, the seashore was an inhospitable place where travel challenged even the hardiest of visitors. Nevertheless, the original bathing beach pioneers appeared undaunted in their quest to establish enclaves along the shore. Music is the thread that weaves its way through all the Highland Beach decades and stitches together the mood and changes in American society. When Highland Beach visitors first stepped off the trains and steamboats, the carousel music surrounded them. Sacred music played on Sundays to recognize the blue laws and religious restrictions. This musical score that you're going to hear is an 1871 composition written in honor of the Neptune Club. It's called Beautiful Highlands by a well-known composer John Rogers Thomas. In the photos, notice the changes in bathing suit trims highlighted in orange and green. The steamboat publicity poster from North Jersey heading to Highland Beach can be seen in the upper middle. It says, the best of all, excursion to Highland Beach, Goodwill Band, Monday, September 2nd, 1889. Arriving at Highlands is shown in photos at one end of the bridge and the candy store at Highland Beach on the other side. Chris, can you play the music?
Okay, next slide. The willingness to take risks also came with determination. In the documentary, The Men Who Built America, business pioneers believe, quote, wherever there is change, whenever there is uncertainty, there is opportunity. The pioneer has a vision that transforms the moment in their time, unquote. The bathing beach and hotel pioneers who came here were determined to meet these challenges. In the late 1800s, Sandy Hook was struck by a storm that carved an inlet into the peninsula. The military constructed a bridge to keep the trains running until the shifting sands were replaced in future storms. The families who came here look for the same things we do today, a place to relax with family in the sun, swim in the sea, and enjoy time together. They came by steamer, railroad, and sometimes rowboat. The famous Horton's ice cream was waiting at the Highland Beach store as they stepped off the trains. Hey, Chris, you can play the music. Okay. Earl Fuller's ragtime band played their syncopated rhythms at the outdoor bamboo garden and cabaret. Ragtime was a predominant style of American popular music from 1899 to 1917. In the photos, Earl Fuller's band from the famous Rector's Restaurant in New York City gyrates to the music. A precursor to jazz, the Hot Club Band is in the photo at the upper left. Highland Beach families continued through three generations over the 75 years of the resort. The Kirchners are upper center. Their daughter, Julie, married Burt Brenner and a tradition was born. On your left is the 1889 roller coaster that came down after five years. Its timber is used to build the 1893 Sandless House is seen next to the boardwalk in the lower center where visitors take a Sunday stroll. To the far right, William Sandless and close friend Henry Schad are looking dapper in their best clothes. And framed in blue, the horse and carriage bridge from Highlands is the key to the resort's success. Crowds from the mainland can now easily cross the river. During this time of change, inventions heightened the craze. The new technology for bridges, railroads, steamers, and cars brought crowds to the shore. A stampede to the beach followed. The Red Bank Register captures the mood set by sitting in an airplane at Highland Beach, soaring above the crowd, set up in the resort's photo gallery. It was a leading souvenir that summer. Beyond the souvenir card, my grandfather sent additional publicity resort scenes to Germany so they could be hand colored by experts. It took a full year for these postcards to be returned for sale at the resort and local establishments. And just like today, the 1918 Spanish flu marched through the Jersey shore, causing quarantine of Asbury Park on October 8th, after 1,408 residents were diagnosed with the flu that year in a city population of 11,372. And how did they survive the recurring storms? Constant rebuilding and coastal barriers near the ocean and river are a recurring theme at the shore. Chris, you can play the music. At first, jazz was mostly for dancing. After the first recordings of jazz were made in 1917, the music spread widely and developed rapidly. The Bamboo Garden Cabaret, and later on, the Bamboo Room Tropical Nightclub, continued this tradition, bringing in popular bands from New York City. The 1908 Bamboo Garden Cabaret and Beer Garden's entrance is on the upper left. A short hop from the train to a cool refreshment on the lower side, the 1940s New York City Jazz Band entertains the bamboo room crowds. 
winter storms create havoc. And we'll have to get back to that another time because it's on another <laughs> slide with the montage. Chris, can you go back maybe go back one or two? This is where you want to be, right? No, it's up there you are. That's it. Okay. All right, so the 1908 Bamboo Garden Cabaret and Beer Gardens entrance is on the upper left, a short hop from the train to a cool refreshment. On the lower right, the 1940s New York City Jazz Band, you can see in the Bamboo Room, entertains the crowds. In the middle, winter storms create havoc on a deserted peninsula. Snow piles up around the buildings during a snowfall. The December 1913 blizzard is captured in the upper middle with the Sandless House center stage in the midst of the storm. Helen delivered her son Henry in this house while that December 1913 storm raged. The Smith family is to the upper right, showing May, sister of Helen Sandless, and her husband Frank with four of their six children. On the lower far left are photos of Helen and her son Henry Sandless in the 1930s. The Smith family and cousins worked alongside the Sandless family at the resort from 1913 until 1958. In the photos, upper right is a photo of May and Frank Smith with their daughters, Helen and Rita, in 1917. The second generation of cousins is growing in the photo next to Frank and May. Henry Sandless at age 11 years with cousins Doris, Rita, and Fran Smith in front of the merry-go-round at Highland Beach. Cousins Fran and Henry are upper middle, and Fran is on the right on a steamboat headed to the shore. On the far left is a photo of Henry's graduating class from Highlands Elementary in 1928. Just below, Henry is bartending in the newly opened Bamboo Room Tropical Cocktail Lounge at Sandless Bass. Below, Henry and wife Midge are shown during World War II in St. Augustine, Florida, while he attended Officers Candidate School. In the center below are two photos of the third generation of cousins. The five Sandless children are next to Henry and Midge, and the Smith cousins are shown at Sandless Beach. On the far right is a photo of Uncle Johnson Sandless peeking out of the bamboo bar window with cousin Marie Smith as a child and family friends. This is a slice of life at Sandless Beach. I was curious to know, how did time, modernization, and politics affect the resort? After 52 years, the resort moved into the modern era, starting in 1940, just before the U.S. entered World War II. All of these changes took a toll on the aging Will Sandless, and the next generation stepped in. My father and grandmother took over the management of the renamed Sandless Baths Highland Beach. Hey, Chris, you can play the music. Rock and roll music originated and evolved in the United States during the late 1940s and the early 1950s. The musical styles such as gospel, jump blues, jazz, boogie woogie, rhythm and blues, and country music. This new musical area of rock and roll invaded the resort. The Bamboo Garden Cabaret was torn down in the mid-1930s during a modern transformation at the resort. The bamboo room rose out of the former bowling alley and transformed nightlife into a tropical South Seas evening from the 1940s into the 1960s at Sandless Beach. Music played through the warm summer nights. In the photos, seen in the middle top photo, the newly renovated bathing pavilion in Spanish colonial style replaced the golden era Queen Anne architecture. William Sandless stands at the front door. At the start of World War II, soldiers are bivouacked on the hillside above Sandless Bass, upper right. Some of you may recognize the Schneiders in front of the Bamboo Room sign and the Gafkins, residents of the Highland Beach bungalow colony with son Rick at Sandless Beach. The Bamboo Room South Seas revelers are dressed in their best with ladies around their necks. Up to the far right are 1950s teens skateboarding on the beach. You may spot Carolyn McTague, Peggy Peer, Caroline Weiss, 
and possibly dotty bars upper right. A typical beach day with striped umbrellas on the ocean side can also be seen. The idea of a Sandy Hook Park lay dormant for over 30 years. Even in the 1920s and 1930s, the state and federal governments had an interest in creating a parkland on Sandy Hook for public visitors. The plan was shelved at the time. By 1961, our family awoke to the news, the impending park plans by the state of New Jersey, which included the Sandless Beach property. Many decades had passed since the 1893 Sandless House at Highland Beach was moved across the road in 1940 from the middle of Ocean Avenue to the riverside where it stands today. Sorry, I'm just trying to uh, get control back. Hold on one second. Okay. You can see about three quarters up the road to the right, there's a car on the road across from the bamboo um, room and the bathing pavilion. The house used to sit right where the car is. And you can see in the 1940s and 50s, to the far right, the White House sits on the riverside with the big front lawn. It was moved due to a dispute regarding the boundary line in 1940 and the buildup to World War II. The fort, which is just beyond the bungalow colony to the far right, where there are 25 colonies or, or houses in the colony, you enter the military reservation. So all the trucks coming in with the armaments had to go past San Luis Beach through that military reservation, past the guardhouse, and there wasn't enough room on the road for the big trucks to get past the house. So a court suit and um, it, it, it just made a decision by the U.S. government that the house had to go across the street on the riverside. In 1940, it did. Chris, can you get it to go to the next slide? I hope so. There we go. So it all started with a house, at least my interest in what happened. And there you can see the 1893 house on the left. That was when it was a brown shingled building. And then when it was modernized and transformed in 1940, it was painted white and the storefront then was closed up and you can see the awnings over the three windows and then another awning, awning to the right. And it became a family re residence full time. The first floor business then went away and it was um, just a business office in that area where the store used to exist to the far right. Okay, Chris, next slide. The enduring legacy of the resort as a summer complex is echoed in facing down challenges. A place that continued to thrive despite being forced to adapt to recurring hurricanes, transportation changes, 1918 epidemic, economic panics, and prohibition. The wars and social changes heightened the need for transformation. Finally, politics brought the resort to its knees. A passionate lifetime commitment to the resort and its families on Sandy Hook Peninsula came to an end at the shore. Today, Sandy Hook is a living history experience and a nature preserve for public use. This photo is a Facebook posting showing the Sandless House through the window sent to me by a friend, Don Kruger, last week. When I sent the photo to Becky Cosgrove, the owner of Bar's Landing Restaurant, Becky com commented, Wow, that is an interesting photo. It definitely speaks to the period of time where we could only look out and wonder what the next day would bring. Light across the river looks hopeful. Today, only dune grass and the original resort building remain. You can see it as you pass by on your way into Sandy Hook or across the river from the Highland side. We encourage everyone to explore their own past to preserve the histories, places, and family stories that define us all. A local resident stood here Fonse said, preserve history, money cannot buy history. History lives forever. 
Once you get Jersey Shore sand in your shoes, it's hard to get it out. I wrote this book to connect all of the Jersey Shore lovers. I hope everyone who reads it will enjoy it as much as I did writing it. The story brings me back to my roots whenever I open the pages. I wish the same for you. Thank you for having me as your guest speaker. I'm grateful to the Middletown Township Historical Society, Tom Valenti, Randy Gabriellen, Chris Brunner, and all our guests for making this happen tonight. If anyone would like to contact me, the information is on the last slide. We welcome any photos or artifacts to enrich the Highland Beach History Exhibit at the Twin Lights Museum. I'm happy to answer any of your questions, either live or from the chat box. Before we have the Q&A, our guest historian, Chris Brenner, will share a few words about why Highland Beach history is important and his connection to it. Chris? Excellent. Thanks, Susan. Fantastic history. And I think, you know, anyone that's from the area is just continually amazed by what uh, took place there. I particularly love this photo, uh, which was probably taken around 1910, which we think was probably the, the most a prolific year of the resort. Uh, at this stage, all three modes of transportation, steamship, train, and then car, were, were, in, uh, were in use and it brought record crowds. This was obviously a promotional photo and I love it because if you look carefully, almost everybody in the photograph is looking at the camera. And I don't know how in 1910 they pulled that off, but it's a pretty fantastic photo. Um, I can't help but pass by uh, the, the, the space uh, that, you know, where it existed. In fact, if you go on the walkway that takes you across uh, off the Highlands Bridge, you can really imagine what it was like to see views like this. And it's a really fun thing to do. I would encourage everyone uh, to pick up Susan's book. It's an incredible uh, look at the details and what you heard tonight. And uh, it's great reading. We make a great holiday gift. I know it will be for, for a lot of my family. And uh, I encourage you to acquire it and read it and enjoy the, the, the glow of summer's past. So with that, I'll stop there and turn it back to Tom. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Susan. That was a great multimedia presentation. I don't think we've had one like that before. So definitely appreciate it. We do have a couple of questions, and if you have any more, please get them into the chat box so we can address them. Um, this one I think was partially addressed already, but if you want to go over it again, Chris or Susan, um, somebody would like to know about specifically where the resort was located in reference to uh, things that might be there today that we can see. Well, I can um, explain that pretty easily. Um, if, in fact, anybody or the person asking the question is used to coming over the Highlands Bridge into either Seabright to the right or Sandy Hook to the left, the house is tucked inside the pedestrian bridge as you come around the corner heading into Sandy Hook. And those five acres existed right there where you see the, the White House, which is all that remains of the resort buildings, the cloverleaf coming over obscures or covers about two acres of those original five. So possibly there are three acres left between the house and where the um, gates open to go into Sandy Hook today. So if you're familiar with that, that's where it would be located. Chris, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, no, that's perfect. The only thing I would add, which is a lot of fun, uh, if you go on that walking bridge, um, which is a, a great place, just beautiful views, um, in photographs that we've um, documented back, you, you, you may have seen there was a, a very early roller coaster that once uh, was at the, result, uh, at the resort. And if you stand on the part of the walking bridge as it, as it ramps down on the hook side, that is roughly where the roller coaster would have been. And the view from the tower of the roller coaster would have been almost identical to the height and view you have on the landing of that walkway. So uh, everything old is new again. And a uh, hundred years later, you can stand there and have the same view. So I would encourage anybody that's interested to, to go do that. That's interesting. Another question we have, is it true that the bamboo or the bamboo room came up from Havana? Yes, it is. My grandfather in 1908 made a, a trip 
um, with his wife and his brother. They did a cruise to Jamaica and to Havana, Cuba. And he was so entranced with the tropical feel that he ordered like something like three train loads of bamboo to be sent up to Long Branch on his return. And it did arrive in Long Branch. And it was all green bamboo that had to be cut down and made usable in order to create his bamboo garden attraction, which became quite famous in the area. And then it was repurposed in 1940 when my father took the old bowling alley, which had originally been attached to the back of the Sandless House, moved it across the riverside and created a contemporary um, cocktail lounge with a South Seas um, feeling. And they used the bamboo to create the cocktail lounge. It had a luncheonette next to us. It also had a Jamaican porch on the back, which also was from Port Antonio, Jamaica, during many of their visits in the winter time. And they used to like to make those visit styles to get ideas to increase the attractions um, so that more people would come and it would stay up with the times. Chris, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I think that that's perfect. The theme of the bamboo through the whole resort was uh, was was fantastic and definitely um, fit very well into a lot of eras. Uh, both, you know, all the way back, uh, they repurposed it in the bamboo garden, which was also a movie theater, and and then the nightclub, and then later into the '40s and, and '50s, even with the bamboo room. So uh, very resourceful, reusing that original shipment of bamboo. Uh, we have a, we have a few people asking about what is going on with the house now and what does its future hold. So I'll, I'll answer what I know about that, and then Chris, I think um, he could also say something about it as well. Um, we we put together um, a nonprofit. Um, a few years ago, maybe three years ago, with the hope that we could save it. And the Park Service is more than willing to give us the house if we move it. And th therein lies the dilemma. Um, where would it go and keep its historic significance? There's very little extra land on that peninsula that would keep it historically significant. So um, it just sits there. It's on the demolition list for the future sometime for the um, Park Service if nothing comes up to save it or to move it to a, a new location. So we're just putting all our efforts right now into saving the historic legacy of, of Highland Beach because we don't have any options and we don't know what the future holds for the house. Chris? Yeah, I would, I would just concur with that. Uh, it was a really, uh, I think, well-coordinated and, and well-designed effort. Uh, we made a lot of uh, outreach to local politicians, even, even national politicians, uh, to work with the Park Service to try and find a solution. But the com combination of budgets and other things that are going on with Sandy Hook out you know, towards the Fort Hancock area where they're trying to just keep that alive, um, they, they just don't have any resource for that. And then um, in addition, as Susan said, they, they really can't um, uh, you know, support us on that piece of land because it is uh, Park Service land, so so that's where it is. And, and unless it were millions of dollars to move it, it would be very expensive and we'd need a place to put it. And that doesn't look likely at this point. Mm. It's a shame, but uh, not too surprising. Chris, this uh, question is mainly for you. That last uh, postcard that you showed, the trifold one, was, mm -hmm. was that hand colored in Germany? I, I think so. Susan may know better. I know there's a photograph of that as well. And I think. I am pretty positive, and correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong, Susan, I believe there is a, one of those long, like three foot photographs of that that hangs in, in bars landing today. I think that's one of the ones that's, that's up there uh, in the rafters. But that was probably, yes, made, I know it was a, a pamphlet that was made as a, as a resort brochure, probably sent out to Germany, possibly hand colored. I don't know, Susan, if you know more about that one specifically. Yeah, they had many panoramas done over the years that are absolutely beautiful in, in black and white. But anything that you see hand colored that belonged to the resort itself would have been sent by my grandfather to Germany. They had um, the lithographers, or lith I, I don't even know how to say that word. And anyway, um, they the printers there would turn them <coughs> these beautiful colored versions of what you would have seen in real life. 
and then would send them back. And my grandfather would place them not only at the resort, but in other local establishments in the Highlands and Seabright and around the local area. Yeah, I would, I would tack on to that too. And a lot of the early advertising up through that era was also done up, up in the city and in North Jersey because so much of the crowd were, were day visitors that would come down on the steamboat. So there were a lot of ads taken out in, in New York newspapers and, and uh, delivered as packages with the steamship uh, companies as well. So a lot of it was used that way as well. Okay, thanks. Um, our friend John Schneider asks, how far north did the resort go? Did it go to Plum Island? No, it did not go to Plum Island. We used to walk there in the early 60s. Um, the, the resort itself ended after the 25 bungalows that belonged to the, to the resort. The bungalows were owned by the people who lived in them, but the land was leased from my grandfather. So um, thank you for putting that up. So you can see right there, every summer starting in the late 1890s, or um, I think it was late 1890s, I'm not sure which one of the 90s, um, someone who had a houseboat asked my grandfather if he could park it for the winter on the land behind the bathhouses. And he said, sure, go ahead. And at the end of the year, the next year arrived and he wanted to do the same. And at that point, my grandfather decided there was a leasing possibility in allowing the land to be used. And before he knew it, every year, more and more people came and asked if they could put a, a house on the land and lease it from him. And pretty soon, all of the land was full. And at the end of that land, you see a, a little brick house just beyond it and a little tiny booth going into um, Fort Hancock. And right at the very end of those bungalows is where the resort ends. And in fact, that, that building, not, not the guardhouse, but the brick building is still there today. So that, that, those are the two structures that sort of bookend the property to help you identify it. So you have the house, which you can see in this picture on the left, which still stands in that location today. And then that brick house, which is now just south of where the new pay gates are. The new pay gates are just beyond that to get into the hook. But that gives you a framework of, of where the resort's at. Do you have any information about the photo gallery that was there in the mid 1890s operated by a photographer named Van Tyne? Yes, he only remained for, I believe, two years. And he was a very popular photographer in the area at the time. I believe he had a brother who worked with him. And um, he did not do this picture, though. That was Andrew Coleman in later years. Van Tyne was only there in the 1890s. Um, by 1912, Andrew Coleman was running that, and he was very creative. And his pictures took on a, a more modern feel compared to the tintypes by the Van Tyne brothers. So that was the, the major difference. OK. Um... Can you talk about what it was like for the soldiers on Fort Hancock? Did they get to visit the resort? You know, that's a very good question because people do ask about that. And I did some research on that recently. And as it turns out, the um, soldiers were only allowed one day a week for their leave. And while they were on base, they had everything conceivable to entertain them. They had the ocean and the river to swim. They had a canteen to socialize. They had a bar that served beer. They had a movie theater. They had um, dances. So for them to come out on their leave day, they tended to go farther than the beach because, or their beach club or the resort because they were visiting friends. Sometimes they would take a, a ferry that went from the fort over to New York City for the day because they had to be back by evening. Or they would go over to the hotels in Ireland's where they had bars and um, all kinds of other miscellaneous activities going on. And then they would go down to Long Branch and spend the day with family or friends if they had any that were local. So they had um, many things, including Asbury Park, Ocean Grove, um, Eatontown, Red Bank, you know, all kinds of, of things to entertain them. So even though soldiers could go into the bamboo room and, and did on occasion, um, they, weren't, um, they weren't there to, to swim or find entertainment because they had the same entertainment on the base, just 
a mile away or two miles away. Yeah. Mm, that makes sense. Do you have any fit, any interesting physical souvenirs from Highland Beach? Yes, absolutely. We'd love to have some artifacts to feature in an exhibit that's being planned um, to enlarge the one we already have there right now, which is closed due to um, COVID-19, unfortunately, but it will open in the future. And then um, they're planning two new panels up in the north and south towers featuring Highland Beach and William Sandless and what occurred there. And you can go up to the tower and overlook Sandy Hook exactly where it used to be. And I believe in the, the south end of the museum, they'll be planning a new exhibit as well that they'll enlarge and increase about Highlands and possibly Highland Beach. So sure, we'd love to have artifacts to add to that. They're always welcome and we always seek them. And you already have a good amount of artifacts too for that? We have some. Um, we put out a call for artifacts two years ago when we first um, cooperated with Twin Lights, who were really wonderful in becoming partners with us, and Jeff Tyler and Mark Stewart and um, his friend Skip, several other people um, put out the word and we started to get artifacts from people that either went there or they had grandparents that were there, or in some cases even great grandparents. And we have some pretty interesting ones on display right now. And when it opens again, um, anybody, visitors can go in and take a look at them. Um, some coins turned up in the beach back in the 50s. One family, Lori Fleischman's family, um, her father found them. And they used to be, um, they were like quatrefoil coins that must have been in some type of mixed metal. And it said Surf House Hotel on one side and then 10 cents on the other side. So they must have been able to get these coins when they went into the hotel at Highland Beach and then use them for any number of things. I'm not sure what, it doesn't say what the 10 cents could be used for. We'll all have to guess about that. Mm -hmm. So that was one example, for instance. Um, there's also a, a trophy up there from gala days back in the 1890s when they had yachting regattas and um, a full day of activities and games and um, fireworks at the end and a dance in the evening. And it was um, one of the days when 15,000 people would come to Highland Beach to celebrate. They did that for many, many, many years. And so uh, a, a yachting trophy is up at, at I think you're underselling it, Susan. I have to say it's pretty incredible when you when you look at the documentation and the pictures from these gala days where they had all these contests and everything. I mean, imagine you can see the size of this this piece of property. Imagine fifteen or twenty thousand people descending on that, and celebrities would be there. The governor would attend. I mean, this was a really really big deal, and uh, it's amazing when you look at the strip of sand now. Uh, to imagine that many people sort of packed in there. It really must have been something. They were like sardines in the photographs. Mm -hmm. They were not socially distant. <laughs> no. <laughs> Susan, a couple of people are asking, was, uh, was the land eventually purchased under eminent domain? And how did your, your family feel about that? It was purchased under eminent domain. Um, we were notified really um, in the fall of 61 that this was going to happen. Um, it wasn't going to happen until the following summer in 1962. So in 1961, that was the last summer that we operated as Sandless Beach Club. And the last summer that the families could come to the bungalow colony or use the nightclub or the luncheonette or the Jamaican porch. And so um, what happened in the end was um, my family was not happy with the the funds that were offered because those five acres of land and the family business and family home um, were valued originally at, at a much higher price through ordinary real estate um, representatives. So um, the government doesn't usually offer that type of value for a property when they're going to take it over um, through eminent domain. So um, we went to court. My father and my grandmother felt that they wanted um, a court to make a decision about that. And so they did increase the value. And that following summer in 1962, um, we um, got ready to move. But we didn't move because the court case didn't end until 63 in um, June. 
and we had to stay there and wait for the decision to come down. Um, we were pretty sure we would, we knew what would happen, but you, you couldn't do anything in the meantime except wait. So in 1962, that summer, they wanted to open the park and they wanted all of the buildings gone except for the house which they wanted to use for residence for park rangers and the bamboo room which they were going to use for storage and maybe in the future they were thinking about making it into a museum but that never happened because in 1978 it burned down through arson and they're not really quite sure how that happened they thought maybe teenagers smoking or something like that but they did demolish all the buildings in the summer of 62. We had to wait until June of 63 before we could move. And that was the, the end of the resort as we knew it. Oh, that must have been sad to see all those buildings come down. It was very sad. Yeah. Um, Randy Gabriellen has a question. Um, how did the operation of military terry trains impact the resort? Well, I don't think it impacted the resort in any particular way, except it could be noisy. I remember um, not the trains going by, but I remember the, the cavalcade of trucks and they were noisy unto themselves. But during the, the time when the trains came through, you can see how close the train tracks are to the actual resort buildings. And so the train would simply, the passenger trains would simply stop and the passengers would get off and they would go into the resort and, and any troop trucks or other types of things with armaments or whatever would just click clack along the lines and just go on through from what I understand. So um, they were used to seeing trains constantly come through there to drop off the passengers. So I imagine it just was common practice and people got used to it. I don't know, Chris, do you know any more about that? Uh, I don't, other than that, uh, you know, at, at this era, and you can see in the picture that's up now uh, in the lower right, I mean, the, the, you had to cross the tracks to get to the beach, right? So there was a lot of pedestrian and train interaction, never a good idea. Uh, but as far as we know, we didn't really find a lot of history about accidents, or I'm sure there must have been, but uh, it doesn't seem to have been a big, a big problem. Uh, and more interesting later on, as you got more towards the 1940s, when the train line uh, wasn't so much out to Sandy Hook, but was the, the train that ran down along through Seabright and, and crossed over the bridge into Highlands, uh, you know, those train tracks crossed the road as well. And uh, actually in the film, there's uh, some footage of a car almost getting hit by a train, which is kind of interesting to watch. Um, but uh, that along with, uh, as my, my dad used to say, the old sport was to uh, drive down Ocean Avenue and try and race the train in your car and see if you could outrun them. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the train went all the way to Long Branch and it went all the way to the end of Sandy Hook out to the fort. And that was the basic run from here to there. Susan or Chris, can either of you talk about the merry-go-round that was part of the resort? There were two merry-go-rounds. The first merry-go-round was built in the 1880s, um, shortly after the resort went up. And that remained there for um, uh, quite a long time until 1908 when they built the bamboo garden and they needed that space in order to put the beer garden and cabaret in. So they took um, the, the merry-go-round apart and then there wasn't any merry-go-round anymore for a few years. You can see the garage door there in the building where they have the poles going up for the pennants to fly in the summer. And over here to the far left, um, oh no, that's gone. Okay, so right here, that's where the merry-go-round existed in the 1890s up until 1908. And when it came down, it didn't return for a few years to Highland Beach, but when it did return, it was at the opposite end of the resort. Chris, maybe you can bring up the more contemporary version. Yeah, well, you can see that's the red roof there, yes? Yes, so that's the contemporary version that existed in the 1930s. It was probably there in the 20s as well. And then eventually that was taken apart in the 40s and turned into a summer cottage for our cousins, the Smiths, who worked with us all through the years from 19, um, 13 to almost 1958. And you can see the little cottage down here to the left of the white sandless house. 
and they lived on the side where the um, screen porch faces the river. And then there was a place on the back side for vehicles and, and things from the resort to be stored. That's it. Susan, do you know if, or did you ever request any type of archeological dig anywhere? We did ask the park service, um, the coordinator, unit coordinator out there, if that would be a possibility because they did do an archeological dig on the other side of the bridge when it was being staged to be built. And the park service said they didn't have any interest in having an archeology span dig on the Sandy Hook side. And that was the end of the discussion. I would love to see it happen. Mm -hmm. No telling what's under the sand after all those people <laughs> came through. <laughs> yeah. Lots of yeah. lost change. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any film or movie records of the resort? I do. Um, in the 1950s, my father was given a, a small film camera and he became um, a film buff at, at using it. So we had about eight reels of film footage from Sandless Beach, for, really for several summers. But unfortunately, only one remains, which I gave um, the footage to Chris and he utilized some of that in the documentary. But the other seven reels disappeared one summer back in the 80s when I went up to visit my sister and all the family members were gonna be there. So we thought we'd have a wonderful evening, watch all these old home movies, so to speak, of Sandless Beach Club. And I left them with her to turn into a, a video. And she moved shortly after, and to this day cannot find the other seven reels. They're, oh, they're in storage sure. somewhere. Yeah. I'll add to uh, on, on my website, the destinationspass.com, when you click on the Highland Beach page, there are clips uh, I had from my family archives. Um, there were some friends of my, my grandparents uh, from the 1930s in the bungo, uh, bungalow colony. And it's just sort of general life and what life was like on a summer evening there. Um, but it's neat to watch and get a sense of what it felt like uh, in the 1930s. You can see the, what's now the old Highlands Bridge was brand new, shiny white, uh, had just been built. Um, so you can, you can get a look at it from that, from that perspective. I know there's some wonderful footage that you have from Paul Caption, yeah. who lived in the bungalow colony, and he took lots of films from the 1930s, and um, they're a, a wonderful capsule of what life used to be like. Yeah, if you haven't yet seen it, just once again, go to destinationspass.com and uh, look at Chris's movie, and you can see some, some of the, the actual footage. Um, I don't see any more, well, I see just one last question, Susan, if anybody has any others, get it in now. Um, but do you have a good story about being rescued from the house during a storm? I do. When I was nine years old, um, at that point, we had five children and two grandmothers in the house and my two parents. And every year, it seems that hurricanes would come along or very serious storms, and our family got used to it. And they got complacent about these storms and they never left the house. They always made it through the storms. So they didn't take them all that seriously. I mean, consider my father being born in the house during one of the worst hurricanes ever to hit the, the Sandy Hook Peninsula and Seabright in the local area. They stayed right there in the house. And um, the doctor couldn't get to my grandmother to help her and there were all kinds of complications because of that. So when I was nine, Sure enough, that afternoon, I heard my parents in the living room talking about whether or not they should leave the house. And my mother was just distraught thinking about the forecast. And my father said, don't worry, Midge, it won't be a problem. We stay every time. We'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It'll be okay. Four o'clock in the morning, uh, my bed was listing across the floor my walls were shaking. My father was at the bedroom door and said, hurry, Susan, get dressed. We're leaving the house. And so all nine of us went downstairs to the front door. The water was already up to the front door and the Coast Guard boats were coming along, putting all of us in the boats, um, taking us up to the bridge where my uncle, Phil Sheehan, was waiting to take us to the Molly Pitcher in Red Bank. And it was probably one of the scariest moments of my life because I wasn't sure we would make it in the boat in the middle of the hurricane in a tiny boat. 
all the way to the bridge, which seemed like 100 miles away at the time. But fortunately, we all made it safely, and we had to stay a whole week at that hotel before we could return to the house. But the house remains. It made it through that hurricane, and it made it through Superstorm Sandy. Um, it just seems to be in a protected area, somehow tucked away down and, there. But it doesn't hurt when you when you build a house out of the timbers from a roller coaster. It tends to hold up. It seems so, doesn't it? Susan, was the resort uh, operated year round, or is it just in the summertime? Just in the summertime. My father would start getting ready in March, and he'd work diligently with another person who helped with all the repairs that had to be done after the winter storms until uh, Memorial Day. So it would open Memorial Day weekend, would stay open until Labor Day weekend, and then it would take him from Labor Day weekend until about mid-October to actually batten down the hatches, close it down, do everything that had to be done. And then um, in um, December and November, my parents would kind of relax for a little while as far as the beach club was concerned. And then in January, he would start the business of sending out all of the, the memberships, um, the paperwork and things like that for people to sign up for the coming season and do all the paperwork until March. But my father worked in the winters. Um, he was a carpenter like his father and his grandfather, and he worked for a company nearby. And he would work from October until March, and then he would go back to the, the beach business and get busy getting that ready. We have one last question from John Schneider. He asks, is, is my mother one of the only living people pictured in the book? <laughs> Do you know, I think that's a good question, and he's probably right. <laughs> There aren't a lot of 90 to 100 year olds left around to tell us firsthand about Highland Beach. <laughs> but I have had a call um, from at least one, and um, it, she was 102. And it was a wonderful conversation. She was so excited about working. Um, not in this, this one. Can you go back to it? That was the, the modern. Venue. I just wanted to show Mrs. Mrs. John's mom there, right? Oh, yes. It's, uh, fantastic. Love that picture in front of the bamboo room sign. Beautiful picture. It's um, one of my favorites. You want maybe this one? Um, keep going back. Hmm. No, oh, try going back. Actually, right here, where you see the house with the red roof and the red um, lower roof there, yeah. that was the bamboo bar. The bamboo bar was different from the bamboo garden and the bamboo room. They were all in different buildings. This bamboo bar was run by my Uncle Johnson Sandless. It had a billiards room and the bowling alley attached to it. And that's where the 101 year old woman worked as a teenager. And she worked for my Uncle Johnson. She said she was underage, so she wasn't allowed to carry alcohol. She could only carry soft drinks. But the, the beautiful thing about that is that where the train tracks are between the people sitting on the boardwalk and the house, the trains let people off right in front of the front door there and the windows on the side. And those windows all opened where refreshments were handed out to the people pouring out of the trains who were dying of thirst in the heat. And she was allowed to ferry all the drinks to the people that wanted them coming off the trains. So that was her story. And then I've spoken with two in their 90s, two people who have wonderful stories as well. All right, Susan, Chris, thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have tonight. But oh, Susan, congrats on the book. And uh, once again, thank you. And if anyone have, wants any additional info um, or purchase the book, you can see it on your screen right now. If anybody wants to learn more about the Middletown Township Historical Society, our upcoming speakers, or become a member, visit us at middletownnjhistory.org. Our next event will be Monday, November 16th. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Tom. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chris.